Hello everyone, today I'm bringing you the second in a series of videos looking at the Canadian 1982 pattern web equipment. In part one we have a look at the set of equipment on the mannequin. This is the basic fighting order taken from the manual, not really re meant to represent use in the field per se, this is just the basic set of equipment as shown in the manual for fighting order. We don't have a respirator, have a sack and so forth as mentioned in part one, that will all be covered in future parts of this series. In this video, we're going to have a look at these components, which we have on the mannequin here in a bit more detail, have a look at the fixtures and fittings and so forth, how the pouches attach onto the belt, all of those little details. So that's what we're going to have a look at now. So the first thing to have a look at in a little bit more detail here is the manual, and this is the 1983 manual for the 1982 pattern webbing. And you'll notice this is 1982 pattern webbing, not web equipment or anything, webbing is the term used, the user's field manual. Now the manual doesn't have a great deal of bearing on what was done in the field in terms of how the equipment was set up. It does show you how the various components attach together. Uh, so the diagrams of this in terms of where stuff was carried and so forth do vary from unit to unit quite a bit depending on what uh, uh, the, uh, the unit orders were. But this nevertheless shows how the various components connect together and I think the, the sort of visual uh, reference that provides will be quite useful. So you have both the English side here and halfway through it's in English and then if you flip it over the rear cover is in French and then you have the French side on the other side there. Makes sense of course for Canadian equipment. If we open this up here uh, there are various uh, sections at the start about the intention behind the equipment and the aim of the manual. Obviously follow the rules here, uh, it's your back so basically follow the rules, the, the equipment set up properly will allow you to carry the equipment comfortably is the idea behind that. Um, I'm sure there are many who use the equipment who would probably differ on, on that basis. But you can see here an illustration of the, the basic sort of uh, fighting order we, we looked at on the mannequin, which as I say is not necessarily what you'd see in the field, it's not what you're going to see uh, people wearing uh, in actual service, but it's what the, the manual shows and that's what I chose to initially recreate on the mannequin. We'll be having a look at uh, various other details going forward. Uh, to looking at the equipment as it was used in the field a little bit more, at least some examples of that. It varied from unit to unit quite a bit, as I say. So as you can see here, we have the various components we looked at on the mannequin in the illustrated pages here. There are some we haven't looked at yet, which we will do in future videos. And what we're going to get on first, to first of all, is the, uh, the uh, yoke and how that's assembled. And as you can see, it's actually a separate component the yoke, the section that goes over the shoulders and the straps which attach onto it. So we'll have a look at this first of all and then come back to the manual and look at attaching it to the belt and so forth. So here is the basic component which allows the yoke to be assembled and this is the section which is padded and passes over the shoulders. You can see the material that this is made from is basically the same cloth as the combat uniform itself. You can see the, the interesting texture of that there. It's a, a nylon cotton mix as I remember. Uh, which gives you this sort of uh, almost uh, salt and pepper look to it, I guess you could say. And then you have the nylon straps passing over the top of that. Obviously you've got loops here, which mean you can attach things to the yoke. You occasionally see a compass pouch attached up here. Nylon padded section across here with eyelets for attaching a piece of equipment here. The manual states the entrenching tool should be carried up here. And we'll have a look at how these operate and how the, fix the, uh, the plastic fittings on the back of the pouches and other components operate a little bit later on. A nylon section at the back here which the buckles attach onto for the rear straps and I'll bring one of the straps in now and just show you how these attach and then we'll have a look at the yoke fully assembled. So if I bring one of the straps in here you have the hooks here which attach into the eyelets which we'll have a look at in more detail in just a minute. The end of this is sewn over so it's a double thickness but it will nevertheless pass through the buckles and you'll notice these buckles are an olive drab finish and that's something that would change later on. They'll be changed to black plastic. So this is a, a relatively early uh, yoke. And you can see that there, how these attach on to basically make up the yoke. But they are separate components uh, which need to be attached to these buckles. They are fully removable as you can see here. Now we now have the yoke with all four straps attached as you can see here. So the straps are all fully adjustable. They're all, all four of the straps are the same design fully adjustable through these buckles, both front and rear, as you can see. And these attach onto the components, which have the suitable fittings, or onto the belt using these plastic hooks here. And I'll bring in a belt now and we can see how these work, and also we'll then have a look at the ammunition pouches and how they attach onto these as well. 
So we have the belt here, and as you can see, the inside face of this has a sort of heavy uh, webbing material and then a lighter nylon duck or webbing on the outside here. Obviously nylon straps stitched to both sides of the front here with the Fastex type buckle there as you can see. We actually have the, it's a Nexus buckle, it is actually a Nexus buckle, you can see the details on the back there. Obviously that just snaps together like that, a common feature that was becoming more common on, on various different designs of web equipment at the time. And then you have a stamp here which is rather difficult to make out but we have that there. You can see it's become rather worn over time and obviously details written in the back here of the previous uh, user of this um, person it was issued to. Interesting feature of this is there is a line of white stitching down the centre line at the back which is quite useful when, for when uh, uh, attaching components onto this. And the eyelets are obviously how things are attached onto this generally speaking. There are a couple of components that just attach with belt loops but most of the pouches and so forth attach using the eyelets and we'll have a look at that in just a moment. The manual shows the first component to be attached for fighting order, excuse me, turn it the right way up, is the utility pouch to be attached in the centre line. You can see the centre thread mark noted there and you can actually see that on the inside face here as well. We're not going to do that, we're going to talk about the yoke in, in conjunction with this because it allows me to show a couple of things before we get into talking about the various components. But this does show you how components attach on using the little hooks on the back and we're going to talk about that more in just a moment. So I have the belt spread out here with the, the centre line here and we have the yoke up top here. And in fighting order the straps attach directly onto the back of the, the belt. So the way these hooks operate, and the reason I'm doing it with these is it's probably the easiest component to do this with because it's the most flexible to sort of attach and, and uh, remove from the belt. You bring in the plastic hooks like this, and I tend to, to hook the lower one in first, and you can see that sort of presses through, and then it's just the right size to fit through the eyelet, so it's quite a snug fit in there. And then just bend this down a little bit, get the top hook in there as well, if we can. I can hopefully show this in the camera. There we go, if we get the light in there, bend that down, and hook that in as well, and there we are. That's now attached onto the belt. So that's how the hook and eyelet system works. It's very, very simple. This differs somewhat from the trial version of this, and it differs from the later version adopted by Germany as well, which was similar but different. Uh, and it's a very simple way of doing things. And most of the components we're going to look at also have a Velcro or touch and close belt loop as well, but the, the yoke doesn't do that. So you've got that there, as you can see at the back there. That's how the yoke would attach on to the back of the belt like that, as you can see. So to remove this, you again just do it in reverse, flex that, unhook the top one, and then the bottom one just pulls out like that. And the reason for showing it with the yoke primarily here is it's probably the easiest component to do it with because you're only dealing with two hooks rather than four on the back of the other components. It's the easiest way to show this in camera. We'll look at some of the other components now and we'll get on to talking why you have a little loop here with touch and close. Uh, and obviously we'll see that when we attach this onto the ammunition pouches. We'll talk about that as well. We'll move on to have a look at the ammunition pouches now. The ammunition pouches we have here are the ones which were on the set of equipment we looked at on the mannequin, and these are for the C1, which is of course Canada's version of the FNFAL, which was due to be replaced in the 1980s, but was still in use when the equipment was initially introduced. So these are the first issue ammunition pouches, and therefore the ones we're going to talk about in this video. We'll have a look at the external details first of all. Have a drainage eyelet at the bottom here, which you can see on both of these. They aren't a handed pair, they're just a, a pair of, of identical pouches. There's nothing that marks these out of, as left or right. We should a pair for use with the C1. Quick release at the front here, as you can see, and we'll open these up in just a moment. This pointed lid or flap, as you can see there. And then on the back, we have the system for attaching these onto the belt. So as we've already seen how these hooks work through the eyelets. You have two sets here, so four in total and then also this touch and close loop which closes around the belt for extra security. The top here you have a strap coming up with two eyelets set into it and this is to allow for the yoke to be attached onto these and we'll have a look at that now. I'll just bring the, the yoke back into shot, bring it up at the top here and obviously this would be attached onto the front of the belt. You then have the strap coming down from the yoke and that then attaches into these eyelets at the back here on this top strap, like that. And then you have this touch and close loop which closes around there to keep that secure. And that's how this directly supports the ammunition pouches around at the front of the belt. So rather than these attaching onto the belt itself, they attach directly onto the back of the ammunition pouches in order to help carry the weight of the ammunition. 
So have that feature there. And this is a feature which will be introduced to the utility pouch going forward, but is not part of the initial version, which we're going to be having a look at in this video. That's something we'll discuss further in future parts in this series, all being well. So we'll open this up now and have a look at the internal features, which are quite interesting. There's a somewhat smudged stamp in the flap there, as you can see, and this is a rubberized material on the inside there, as you can see, sort of a vinyl uh, material for waterproofing. And then inside, there are two straps uh, which run, well, there's a div central divider, first of all, which you can see in there, and two straps which run in nylon webbing loops sewn in there and there, as you can see. And this is a feature which had been used in preceding designs of equipment. The British 1958 pattern equipment had something in the first two issues of ammunition pouches which was very similar to this, and a similar de design was also used with the USM 1967 equipment. The idea of these straps is when you pull them up, they actually raise the magazine and allow it to be extracted more readily. So you have one of those straps for each of the compartments. These would each hold a single 20 round magazine for the C1. So you have 40 rounds in each pouch in uh, two magazines. So uh, in two magazines in each pouch. So that's a look at these pouches for the C1. There were, of course, pouches specific to other weapons, notably the SMG and the C2, and latterly the C7. There were various versions of C7 pouch which had various different external features, which we'll hopefully talk about going forward, although that's somewhere down the line. It sort of falls a little bit out of my area of interest because that's the very late 80s, 90s uh, developments in the design. But that's a look at these C1 ammunition pouches. We'll move on now to have a look at the water bottle canteen carrier. So here we have the water bottle or canteen carrier, and the external details of this are basically draw together components we've seen on the other pieces of equipment we've looked at so far. We have the quick release fastener here. Obviously this is shaped to go over the neck of the bottle as you can see. The cup is nested underneath it here. So quick release fastener there. Obviously nylon tape binding the edge of this as you can see there. And on the back we have the same fitting as we saw on the ammunition pouch with both a velcro belt loop or touch and close belt loop and the four hooks for attaching this through the eyelets on the belt as you can see there. So that's the external details of this. If I open this up we have the nested cup and water bottle and you can see that there we have a date of well, there's no date on this one I think but it is Canadian manufactured cup and we have a 1972 dated Canadian bottle in there as you can see so stainless steel cup and plastic water bottle as you can see there and then you can see the internal details of this there is an internal strengthening piece where the rim of the cup would bear on the inside of there which makes a lot of sense later you'd see an external band added as well which we'll hopefully have a look at in a future video uh, the uh, the later versions of this so that's the the water the basics of the uh, the canteen or water bottle carrier there as you can see so pretty simple bit of kit just a pouch that carries the cup and bottle or cup and canteen nested together the next component to have a look at here is the utility pouch and you can see open this up here this is something we looked at recently in a video on mess tin pouches it is nicely sized to carry the mess tins but it was also designed well it was designed as a utility pouch to also carry waterproof clothing uh, if needed in place of the mess tins or to carry extra ammunition as required so it will be adapted going forward and we'll have a look at the modified versions of this going forward all being well and you can see we have touch and close fasteners on the side there this can be uh, reduced down and closed with the lower quick release if required you can see there if it's not carrying its uh, full load so it can be reduced down like that quite neat and when that's not the case obviously you have corresponding touch and close on the sides here to help keep the lid closed so that velcros down like that which is a neat feature of the design I have that there let's fasten the quick release back up again and then if we look at the back here you have a slightly different way of doing things here. You don't have the single central fixing point for attaching this to the belt. You have two smaller ones on each side and you have the four hooks there and then another four hooks there and obviously two thinner velcro belt loops to go around the, the belt there as you can see. And obviously a strengthening piece of the nylon webbing strap across the back there. So a slightly different way of attaching this onto the belt obviously because you may be carrying a heavy load, a heavier load in here particularly if you're carrying ammunition in this. So that's the utility pouch there and obviously carrying 
the square mess tins in this instance, just to show you that it is very, it's derived from the design of the mess tin pouch and is designed to, to carry these, but can be carried and was intended to be used for carrying various other items as required. Another interesting feature of the design is the entrenching tool and the entrenching tool carrier. Now, there was a shorter version of this, as mentioned in part one, which used the standard sort of size of three-way folding entrenching tool, which had been adopted initially by the US with the M1967 equipment, then standardized with Alice, and then adopted by various other NATO countries. Britain eventually adopted it, Germany adopted it, the Netherlands adopted it. So it was quite widespread in use, the three-way folding entrenching tool. Canada, however, also made this in an elongated version of it, which seems to be by far the more common, certainly on the market today, and certainly in photographs, this seems to be the common entrenching tool that was seen, the elongated version. Um, we'll have a look at the carrier for this first of all, and then I'll get the entrenching tool out and we can have a look at that as well. In common with the water bottle carrier, the flap here is bound with a, a nylon tape, as is this seam all the way around the side here. You can see there is a, a gusset in the bottom here to allow this to open up to carry the end the entrenching tool. The, uh, the When it's folded it does taper down here but you obviously have the, the hinge where it unfolds down at the bottom here which is quite bulky. You have the eyelet in the bottom here for drainage as you can see and looking at the back of this in common with the uh, the utility pouch you have the two fittings here for attaching this onto the belt or onto the back of the yoke. So you have the velcro belt loops there as we saw previously. You do have a uh, stamp in the middle here and that is Manta Limited, I believe, which seems to be quite a common manufacturer of components for this. This, as I say, is per the manual intended to be carried on the back of the yoke and that's quite a comfy place to carry it, but certainly not where it was always carried. And you can see you have the loops on each side here and the idea is that when this is attached onto the back of the yoke, if I bring this in here, it sits around there and the straps would pass down through these on each side to stop it flapping around. So that helps to secure it. So you'd simply run run the straps down through here or more likely unfasten them and buckle them back down through these to help hold this in place on the back. So that's what those two loops are for there, as you can see. And that is covered in the manual. We'll just have a quick flick through to the pages covering that. You can see this here on this page, attachment of shovel to yoke and you can see how the buckles are passed down through there to help secure it on the back. So if we had a look here, the manual itself suggests assembling the belt order, two ammunition pouches, the water bottle, obviously bayonet, knife and fork and, knife, fork and spoon holder, and the utility pouch, and then a, attaching the yoke onto the equipment. And this is for fighting order as we looked at on the mannequin. Again, not a form the equipment would generally be seen used in in the field. But nevertheless, the format I decided to use for the, the first two parts in this series, just to talk about some of the basic components. We'll be looking at the, the other bits and pieces in future parts in this series, as I say. There are a couple more things to have a look at in this video, and we'll move on to look at those now. The final two components we're going to be talking about in this video are the bayonet frog and the carrier for the knife, fork and spoon and the pocket knife. The bayonet frog itself is a very simple design. This is basically carried forward from very old designs of web equipment, very similar to the 1908 pattern, a bayonet carrier, a uh, bayonet frog. You can see it's just made in nylon webbing rather than cotton webbing, but basically has a very similar form. You have a loop which is sewn around here, and then through this bottom section, you then you, you sew in between the two pieces, the ends of these two straps here, which form basically a, almost a buttonhole through which the stud on the bayonet scabbard fits to hold the bayonet in place. And the upper part here just forms a belt loop which slides over the belt. There is a white ink stamp, stamp on the back here, but it's not very clear to see, but you can just see that there. We're getting a bit of inf interference from the shine of the, uh, the nylon there, but there is an ink stamp on the back there. So a very, very simple design. And this would be modified going forward, but this is the design for carrying the C1 bayonet. And then the knife, fork and spoon holder, this one's seen quite a bit of use. It's, it's a bit rough and ready, as you can see. It's a bit, uh, it's a bit worn, but you have a, a Velcro compartment in the back here that opens up and that would carry the three-part knife, fork and spoon set in there. And that just uh, secures like that. And then you have a small pocket in the front here which would contain the C5 knife, the Canadian pocket knife. And that could be carried in there, very similar to the US pocket knife. I don't have an example as yet. I would like to get one. 
uh, but hopefully uh, that may well feature in a future video, future part in this series, potentially. Uh, but uh, I don't have an example of the Canadian pocket knife as yet. But that's what this is for. It uh, neatly carries that. And this again fits on the belt with a belt loop at the back here, as you can see. So got those two components there. If we quickly nip back to the manual and just have a look in here, we'll go back to the section on the belt kit here. You can see that we have, if we flip back a little bit further, you have the utility pouch in the middle there. And then round on the left hip, you would have the bayonet frog there. And you have the, uh, the holder for the knife, fork and spoon set on the right hip there. Obviously, the, the bayonet is generally carried on the left for a cross draw, as mentioned in part one of this, this series. But that basically shows you the equipment as we had it set up previously. And you've got the uh, quick release de demonstrated there as well. And you have the equipment basically in fighting order as we had it for the mannequin there, the utility pouch in the middle, the water bottle pouch there. On the right hip, you have the knife, fork and spoon set. You have the bayonet carried on the left hip. And then this actually shows the SMG magazine carrier here, which is something we'll have a look at in future parts in this series, all being well. And you'd obviously normally you'd have the uh, other ammunition pouch round on the side here, but you can connect the yoke directly to the belt there if required. And there's a gap here left for a future components. And you have here the basically the protective mask carrier labelled as future components. With the initial issue of 1982 pattern, it had not yet been introduced. It would appear later on. The equipment was used with the preceding 1964 pattern, or the, the equivalent, the, uh, the carrier used with the 1964 pattern was also used with 1982 pattern initially, carried on its own separate shoulder strap, and then later a nylon version would be introduced for use with 1982 pattern, which could be attached to the belt using the fittings we've looked at in this video, or carried on its own separate shoulder strap. And that was the more common of the two, uh, in terms of carrying the uh, protective mask because it meant you could carry the protective mask with you at all times even when the rest of the equipment was removed. But that's all something we'll have a look at in future parts in this series, all being well. That's the second part, obviously just looking at the components we had on the mannequin in fighting order and obviously having a look at the, uh, the manual there. So I do hope you found it interesting looking at this, obviously taking a look at the components we have on the mannequin here in a bit more detail. There will be further parts to this series. I can't be certain when there will be. There are some bits and pieces I'd still like to pick up to be able to talk about and show in those videos. Uh, C2 pouches being one particular element of that. I don't actually have a set of C2 pouches yet. Very similar to these, but somewhat elongated to take the longer 30 round magazines. Something I'd like to be able to illustrate in a video. But nevertheless, I am hoping to pick those bits and pieces up and regardless, there will be further parts in this series going forward. If you found this interesting and you'd like to see further parts in this series, Please do consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. And whether you're newly subscribing or you've previously subscribed, please do make sure you hit the little bell, the notification button down below. That will, of course, alert you when I upload future videos. If you really like my uploads and you would like to support the channel, you can. Both Patreon and PayPal are linked down below. And as ever, a huge thank you to everybody who supports the channel using those two methods. It really is greatly appreciated, as I always say. Thank you all very much indeed. If you'd like to follow the channel on social media, you can. Facebook, Instagram and Twitter are all linked down below. And if you'd like to get in touch with me but you don't really use social media, there is of course an email address down below as well. That's everything for this video. So, until next time, bye for now.